it's one of the hikmah that the scholars mentioned why Abu Bar ibn did not embrace Islam. One of the benefits of why he did not embrace Islam is because this is what they would have done from the beginning. If he took Islam, they would have put him in the same. But they believe he's one of them. So he was able to stop. He could say to them, I believe what you guys believe. I have not, not with his religion. So they gave them that feeling, okay, Abu Talib is with us. But he was also defending the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يد السبيل وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد we're in the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and in our last uh, lesson, our last session we spoke about the prostration of, of the uh, Kuffar Quraysh when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited the verses in Surah Al-Najm Kuffar Quraysh prostrated and we mentioned that which is Sahih is the reason why they prostrated is Nibalaghatil Quran al Karim. The reason why they prostrated was the eloquency of the Quran. Quran was, is a very eloquent book. So that eloquence mesmerized them, and that is what caused them to prostrate. And for some of them, a majority of them, it was the first time in which they had the Quran being recited. Before that, there was a policy for them. They had a policy, which is, لا تسمعوا لهذا القرآن والغوم فيه لعلكم تغلبون. The principle was, do not listen to the Quran and try your best to speak over it. And maybe you might be able to overpower it. That was their policy. And this is the policy of those people who do not like to follow the truth who are not inclined to the khayr. When he called his people to Allah for years, Allah tells us in the Quran that he called his people for how many years? Uh, correct, 950 years. Uh, what's the delete? Delete. Proof. MashaAllah. فَلَبِثَ فِيهِمْ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ إِلَّا خَبْسِينَ عَامًا So Nabi Allah Nuh alayhi salam, 950 years he was giving da'wah to his people. But what was their response? وَإِنِّي كُلَّ مَا دَعُوتُمْ لِتَغْفِرَ لَهُمْ جَعَلُوا أَصَابِعَهُمْ فِي آذَانِهِمْ وَاسْتَغْشَوْ ثِيَابَهُمْ وَأَسَرُوا وَاسْتَكْبَرُوا اسْتِكْبَارُ That was their policy. They put their fingers in their ears, they turned away, they made noise, and sometimes, الشديد, our Muslim brothers and even sisters might fall into this. They're being advised, they're being told something, and they don't want to hear it. So they put their fingers in their ears and they make noise and say, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it. As they're walking away, and this is very dangerous. He tells us, when you tell him fear Allah Ta'ala, what happens? Arrogance, conceit, full of himself. He doesn't like what's being said. So he responds in a very arrogant way. Who are you to advise? Why are you advising him for it? If it said to them, fear Allah, what you're doing is not pleasant, it's not pleasing to Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, akhadatul rizza. Arrogance and being full of himself, it overpowers the person. Ala kullid, kufaru Quraysh, this is what happened. Sheikh Safi al-Rahman, al-Mubarak Afuri, rahimahullah, he mentions in his kitab al-Rahiq al maftum which we mentioned, a very beneficial book this book is, Seal of Nectar, a very good book for a, stu a beginner student to read to get an idea 
of the biography and the seer of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Shaykh Rahimahullah, he wrote it amazingly. And he actually won uh, the Nobel, not Nobel Prize. He wrote, he won the, what was it? Jaiza to Malik Fahad. From Malik Faisal. Jaiza to Malik Faisal, I think. There was a competition that was done. Everybody had to submit their biography that they wrote. Everyone on the, everywhere in the world. You got prize. Sheikh Safir Rahman, he submitted this book, Rahiqul Makhtoum, and he came first and he won. So the kitab, highly recommended to read. I encourage people to read. Now this idea that this book hasn't got things in there which are weak and authentic, that if you've studied the basics in Sira, you would know that it's not a condition for everything in the Sira to be authentic in the first place. The asr of the seerah is It's for you to gather in it that which is authentic and that which isn't authentic. Abdul Rahman ibn Lahdi, Imam Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal, and Imam Al Bukhari rahimahullah, and Imam Al Zahabi ibn Hajab, Al Mughlatai. Ibn al Jawzi, all of them, all of them were lenient when he came to the matter related to what the seerah, and they stated that. But if it goes against an authentic narration, or it goes against a concept that's solid in our religion, like Qissatul Gharaniq that we mentioned, it's a story that goes against the concept of the Quran. Everything the Prophet said is a revelation from Allah. And then hear the story saying that the Prophet spoke and not which came out of his mouth was words that was inspired from Shaytan. No, this goes against the Quran. This will win. It's already weak, number one. So we won't be very lenient on that. Are we all together, brothers? Walidalika scholars have even said. The ijma' ahli sirah, the consensus of the people of sirah, when we don't know where their evidence is from, they've not mentioned any senate for it, there's no chain for it, but it's a consensus amongst them. A large quantity of scholars, they said, it's a hujjah, yaratabar. It's a hujjah, it's a proof, it's taken into consideration. They are ahlu ashan, they're the people of the field. They all agreed on this issue, they all transmitted it. Not one of them disagreed. No one weak in this story. Every one of them is transmitting it. Scholars have said this is a what? It's a proof. And this is another uh, session for another time. So Sheikh Safir Rahman, in his Kitab Rahiq al Makhtoum, mentions, he says, Inna ulai kan kufar, that these disbelievers, lam yakunu sami'u kalam Allah qabla dhalik. Before this, they didn't hear the speech of Allah wa ta'ala. A large quantity of them didn't. They didn't want to hear the Qur'an. And because they were Arabs and the language was theirs and the eloquence of the Qur'an was something that they understood and how it was structured, they knew that this was not poetry. These people had poets, poets amongst them. So they knew how poetry was. They knew this was a poetry. They also knew it was very eloquent, the way it spoke. لِأَنَّ أُسْلُوبَهُ الْمُتَوَاصِلَ كَانَ هُوَ الْعَمَلُ بِمَا تَوَاصَى بِهِ بَعْضُ الْمَعْضَى their consistent practice in which they advised one another was what? لا تسبعوا لهذا القرآن Do not listen to this Quran. Abandon it. Leave it. Turn away from it. That was their policy, he said. But فلما باغتت باغتت بتلاوة هذه السورة But when it suddenly came to their ears, they didn't expect it. They didn't want it. It was unexpectedly. The Quran hit their ears. Penetrated their hearts. يعني سورة النجم. وقرأ آذانهم كلاما كلاما إلهي رائع خلاب لا يحاط بروعته وجلالته البيان. Eloquent in the way it's structured. When that hit their ears and their hearts. تفادوا عما هم فيه وبقي كل واحد المصغية إليه. Each and every one of them stood to their grounds and listened. They did not move from their positions. 
And after that, لا يخطر ببالهم شيء سوى As they were listening to it. And the person who's reciting it is Nabiullah Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam. And he recited that you can possibly think of is nowhere close to the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. So they're hearing it from his mouth as he recites it. It takes them by shock and amazement. Nothing else is on their mind. لا يخطر ببالهم Nothing comes to their mind other than this recitation. They're not preoccupied with any other matter. حتى إذا تنا فواتم هذه السورة So he started the surah reciting it until he came to the end where Allah says وَالْمُؤْتَفِكَةَ أَهْوَى فَغَشَّاهَا مَا غَشَّاهَا When he recited that فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكَ تَتَمَارَى هذا نذير من النذر الأولى أزفة الآزفة فما على أزفة الآزفة يعني death is close to you the hour is very very close you see it to be far but it's very close ليس لها من دوني besides Allah تبارك وتعالى there is not ليس لها من دون الله كاشفة أفمن هذا الحديث تعجبون وتضحكون ولا تبكون وأنتم سامدون and then recited the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم فاسجدوا لله وعبدون when the Prophet recited that, they all fell into prostration. Safi rahmani says, Sheikh Safi rahmani says, Thumma sajada they prostrated. La yatamalak ahadun nafsahu hatta kharwa sajida. They fell into prostration. None of them could hold themselves back. All that they found was, this command took them by surprise. Fasjudu lillahi wa abudu. As soon as they heard it, they fell into prostration. They couldn't hold themselves back. The command has now taken over. وَفِي الْحَقِيقَةِ But the reality is, it was رَوْعَةِ الْحَقِّ He says, the truth is the beauty of the truth. The beauty of these words is what took them. And the arrogance, and this is the thing brothers, even atheists at one point, they, 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 the fitra speaks. Even that, the fitra speaks and it comes out. The thing that they deny. There's a, st- there's a phrase that they have for them. What is it? Foxhole something. Like, what is it called? You can help me here. And in the last moments, the atheist realizes يعني, the truth. A lot of them, they come back. Yeah? It's funny. There's another statement they say. And when reality touches them and they are the last moments of death, they uh, they come back to reality. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ذُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّةً وَأَشَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَىٰ شَهِدِنَا أَنْ تَقُولُ يَوْمَ الْدِيَمَةِ إِنَّا كُنَّا عَنَىٰ And Allah took a covenant with each and every one of us. It's in our fitra to know what? Fitra to Allah الذي فطر الناس عليها لا تبديل لخلق الله ذلك الدين القيم ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون The fitra, the natural disposition is fixed inside everybody. مَا مِنْ مَوْلُودٍ إِلَّا وَهُوَ يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَ فَأَبَوَاهُ يَهُوِّدَانِ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِ Every simple person is what? He has that fitra. So that fitra kicks in. There was a, a discussion between a militant atheist who is currently alive. I ask Allah to guide him to Islam. Uh, Richard Dawkins, the author of the kitab, The God Delusion. It was a discussion he was having with one of the journalists um, uh, in Oxford. And as he's talking, Richard Dawkins says, yes, I do not deny that at times I am taken by surprise and awe when I look at the sky and the stars and the galaxies and when I look at the sophistication of science and the way things are, I always do think there is a, uh, a designer who designed all of this. I know, that's the fitrah, that's nothing else speaking. That which is telling you this, when you look at all this, it's the what? It's nothing other than the, the fitrah. So even the non-Muslim, sometimes he, yeah, and he feels the, the power of the Qur'an. Recently there was a person who took all the scriptures being recited by the best reciters, put them all together and the Quran was in the list of those re- scriptures that were recited the Bible the, 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 the Torah whatever all of it was recited and the Quran was amongst those which were recited 
I only wish that they chose Prusari for the for the uh, reciter of the Quran. Allah Kulli, they chose an amazing reciter. But the difference each one had was, and the comments you can even see, <clears throat> the non-Muslims <clears throat> are saying, there's a difference to the Quran when it's recited. I'm telling you brothers, if I wrote an Arabic word, sentence or a paragraph, and I told you to read it, it will never come as beautiful as the Quran. The Quran's milk, for brothers, is just in it. I, this Imam of this masjid is something else, Allahumma barik. The Imam that leads us in this masjid always leaves me in amazement when I hear the Quran. Like I've never heard the surah in my life when he reads it. May Allah preserve him and honor him for dunya wal akhirah. If anybody just listened to this Shaykh's recitation and the Quran that he's reciting, Zah? The Quran is mu'jiz. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a miracle in just those words. Sah brothers, imagine you heard it from the mouth of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet recited it for you. That's what happened to these people. They heard it from the Prophet ﷺ. So brothers, honestly speaking, I've said this before. It's very important we have a very strong relationship with the Quran. If a day comes in your life and you have not recited the Quran, you are prohibited. You are missing out. If a day comes out and you haven't read anything from the Quran, it's not a pleasant day that went by. Something, even if it's small, from the Quran, read it. Have a bond and a relationship with this book. There is nothing greater than the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No human being speech. No lecture, no reminder is as powerful as the Qur'an. And honestly, when you listen to it, just today I was listening to uh, the recitation of Husari, uh, or Surah Al-Qasas, the Riwayat Al-Warsh, Husari reciting it. I'm taken back. The miracle in just listening to the Quran. Sometimes, honestly, I just sit down and I say, should I just leave everything and just literally spend the rest of my life in just the Quran and nothing else? Abandon every other responsibility of teaching and giving classes and just the Quran. So brothers, it's... It's a very important thing to do. Wallahi, the Quran is the best thing. It's a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At least something, this is what they, they felt. And Imam al-Bukhari narrated in his Sahih that Jubayr ibn Mut'ib, he was a non-Muslim at this time. He said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recite in Salatul Maghrib, Surah Al Tur, the Prophet recited Surah Al Tur. When the Prophet Ali Salatullah recited it, when he, re when he reached the ayah, "Am khulqu bin ghairi shayi ibn Abhum al Khaliqun, am khalaq al Samawati wal Ard, bin la yuqinun, am indahum khazain rahmati Rabbika amhum al Musaytirun." When he said, "I heard those verses recited." He said, Kada qalbi ayyatir. My heart was about to fly out of my chest. That's what Jubayr ibn Mut'im said. And then he said, That was the first day in which I made the decision to enter Islam. It was the first drop of Islam when I heard those voice verses. Also, an Imam Ahmad narrated in his Muslim Bisanad in Sahih that Sa'a'a. Ibn Muawiyah, who is the Ab, is the uncle of Al Farazdaq. He came to the Prophet والسلام, and the Prophet used to do this very, very often, where a person would come to him and the Prophet wouldn't say anything except recite verses on them. The Prophet used to do that. والسلام, they would come to him. And all he would do is قال الله تعالى Allah said And he would recite some verses 
The Prophet recited on Sa'asa ibn Muawiyah, the uncle of Farazdaq. He recited, why, why are we mentioning the uncle of Farazdaq? Yeah? What's the significance of mentioning Farazdaq? Farazdaq was a poet. The man who knew the language. So he's a family that knows the eloquency of the Quran and eloquency and eloquent speeches. So when he recited the verses, the Prophet recited on him, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِتْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِتْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَهُ When he heard those verses read, he said, حَسْبِ لَا أُبَالِي أَلَّا أَسْبَعَ غَيْرَهَا Wallahi, I don't care after that day if I've never heard anything after that. Now, where is that in the Quran? It has resilient in Ardu Zilzala. It's the last two verses, right? Majority of us here have memorized that, huh? But do you know the eloquence he knows what that ayah says? The way Allah speaks said that subhanahu wa ta'ala the grammar that he observes and he's saying to you I would I don't I would if I from that day becomes deaf he didn't hear anything after that he's on, it's worth it after what I just said so the reason why these people are saying is because they they know the language you might not feel that way because there's a there's that absence of the language and that's why it's important brothers to give time to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and learn the Arabic language. I, t I said this to you all before. Coming into Islam, when you became a Muslim, the minute you embraced Islam, what became your first language? The Arabic language. The Arabic language is not the language of the Arabs. The minute Nabi Muhammad came, he became our, all of our prophets. The first language for everybody is what? The first language is what? The Arabic language. Then you can say second language is Urdu or Somali or Arab. But the first language is what? Arabic. And that's why, subhanAllah, I was reading previously just a while back the importance of language. In university, I did linguistics. So I was studying about language and the history of language and where language came from. How language is and the development language goes through and how can you teach a child language. First language is a language acquisition. And they teach us these theories and plus things like that. So what I remember doing, subhanAllah, was I was given a dissertation to write about is language is the language that they have a theory called behaviorism, meaning Noam Long, Chomsky, who you all know, is a linguist. He argues that language is something we're all born. It's in our mind already. I said, alhamdulillah, that theory goes in line with what? It goes in line with the, the Quran. Because if you break language into two, language is receptive skills and is what? Productive skills. Receptive skills for everybody is what? They're very easy. That's why you find our parents, for example, if they went to uh, England at, at an old age, their receptive skill is good. They understand what the doctor's telling them. They lack the productive skills. And the receptive skills is listening and what? Reading. Listening and reading are called receptive skills. And speaking and writing is a what? Productive skills. And it's very important that you understand this because when you're learning Arabic, a lot of people, their receptive skills is very high and very strong. They can read books. They could also, uh, their listening skills, they listen to so much speeches and everything, but they lack the productive skills so they can't actually speak the language. They can't write anything. And language is 
Where is it? Asal. What is meant to be from a language? What is needed from a language? The productive skills what matters. Can you go to a shop and buy something? Are we all together? Productive skills is the asal. It's very important that you understand. It's very important that you, sorry, you're able to speak and you're able to write. So I, in my dissertation, I wrote that language is tawqifiyyah, meaning it's something Allah gave us subhanahu wa ta'ala. A child does not learn how to speak. He doesn't learn it. He acquires it. And there's a difference between learning and what? Acquiring. Acquiring is used for something that someone has already got. He has it. It just needs to be ignited. It just needs to be switched on. So the language is something that needs to be switched on and that the child talks. But writing, on the other hand, and reading is something you have to, you have to learn. Are we all together? Ala kullin. I use the ayah and the Quran as my backbone, as, as, as my reference point. And of course, the citations you have to what? You have to use... Uh, other linguists who preceded you in it not only that you have to also do data collection and uh, bring people together and check if it's the same you have to go through your checks and list that they set for you their guideline but that's not accepted according to their standard you can't be biased in the writing of your dissertation can you be biased in your dissertation can you argue strongly it affects your, your writing on your dissertation. When it asks if it's shani, brothers and sisters, this also has an effect when people go to uni and they do this with their writing of dissertation, it affects their stances on Islamic views. That's why you see the person doesn't know that the truth is here in this regard, in this matter, it's crystal clear. And maybe here, okay, there is difference of opinion and there are valid difference of opinion. What happens is because you come from that background, you start to think everything in the religion is what? Subjective. Sah? Why did I go into uh, on this road? How beginning before that? Huh? No, no, no. The life of the Quran was the beginning of the whole lecture. Why did I there was, uh, there's, uh, I had an objective from it? Huh? Yeah, so the first language, that's correct. So the first language of the Muslim is what? The Arabic language. So as soon as you become a Muslim, or you are born as a Muslim and you start to practice your religion, the first thing that you do is what? You go for the Arabic. The minute you get that key, that's a key. It's right there, it's on the floor. You know, the minute you get that key, you just have to be told what door to open it with. This key is for this door, and this key is for that door, and that key is for that door. That's it. You have the keys. You are no longer a stranger. You are no longer a foreigner from your own religion. Does that make sense, brothers? But if you are relying on another language for the rest of your life, you're going to be what? You're going to be miskin, you're going to be saying that the Rahman Hassan said. Huh? But... You go to the source yourself, you go to the Qur'an yourself, you're going to get it from what? The source. So this is what they had, and that was the privilege that they had. They had the Arabic language. And you can reach that level. And enjoy the book of Allah in that regard. So what happened was, when they, the story in Medina was that Kufaru Quraysh prostrated, our brothers the Muhajireen, who were in Abyssinia, they heard that the people of Mecca prostrated. What did they hear? They prostrated. But Chinese whispers, right? The first person to the last person, the story changes. Huh? As you go on. Have you ever done Chinese whispers with your children? You, t you, you tell one child a secret in his ear, and he goes and tells the other one, and then he tells the other one, and at the end... Something else has come out. So what happened in Mecca, or what took place in Mecca, 
was just merely the kuffar of Quraysh prostrating to the idol of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and them feeling the power of the Quran. That's all that took place, right? But the people in Abyssinia, they heard something different. They heard that the kuffar of Quraysh all embraced Islam. That's the story that reached them. And the picture was very different to what it was in reality. So they heard that they prostrated because of what? Because they took Islam. So then with the Muhajirin, they said, those who migrated to Abyssinia, Asha'iruna ahabbu ilayna. They said, if our people have all embraced Islam, then why don't we just go back to our families? If my uncle had embraced Islam, why not go back? And the thing that we have to really realize, brothers, is that if a, if a news reaches from Mecca to Abyssinia, by the time it goes back to, it's, it's, it's not one day, make a phone, it's months on the way. So then by the time they reach Mecca, they hear another story of what they were waiting for. And this happened in Shawwal when it was the fifth year of the Bi'tha. When they were very close. Some of the scholars they said it, they were only an hour away, taqriban. In, um, in, in Mecca, they heard news of the reality. And they realized that now the non-Muslims have become even more harder to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to the believers. So some of them they, desired, they, they chose to go back to Abyssinia and some of them they said Qad balagna Mecca, we reached Mecca we might as well just enter it and see for ourselves. Everyone who entered Mecca, they entered hiding. No one entered out and openly. They were hiding when they entered. And they went to certain people that they believed that they could go to. And some of them, they said, we're not going to take the risk. Or we're going to go back. Now, coming there took months. Again, they have to go back a few months. That's the issue. Uthman ibn Madhur, we're going to mention his story inshallah with ta'ala. Uthman ibn Madhur is mentioned, he entered onto Al Walid ibn Al Mughira. When he saw Uthman ibn Madhur, what was being done to the Muslims and the harm that was being done. He said, Wallahi, inna ghuduwi wa rawahi aminan bi jiwari rajul min ahli shirki. Uthman ibn Madhurun, al Walid ibn Mughira said, You can stay with me, there's no harm, I'm not going to do anything to you. But on the other hand, he's safe, but the Muslims are being harmed. He said, me leaving and coming back, knowing, knowing that I'm safe, but my Muslim brothers here are suffering. I am not going through any of that, but they are being tested and harm and problems they're going through. He said, this is a big problem in me. I'm deficient in just choosing myself over my brothers. فَمَشَى إِلَى الْوَلِيدِ بْنُ الْمُغِيرَةِ So he went to Walid ibn al-Mughirah. فَقَالَ لَهُ He said to him, يَا أَبَا عَبْدِ الشَّمْسِ He said to him, يَا أَبَا عَبْدِ الشَّمْسِ وَفَتْ دِمَّتُكْ The promise that you made, the protection that you gave me is fulfilled. وَقَدْ رَدَتْتُ إِلَيْكَ جَوَارِكَ فَقَالَ لَهُ الْمُغِيرُ لِمَا يَبْنَى أَخِي 
He said, I've taken your shelter. You've taken care of me. I've been with you. And you've been good towards me. So then Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira said to him, why? And he's now, he said, I want to return back the request and the favor. I wanted to be with you and your help. He said, why? Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. Did somebody try to harm you from my people? Whilst you were under my protection, under my care, they took that very serious. They would kill them. If anybody tried to do something to someone that they gave dhimma to. A dhimma means care, protection. So somebody tried to do something to you whilst you were under my dhimma, he said, La. وَلَكِنِّي أَرْضَى بِجِوَارِ اللَّهِ What I want is I want to be under Allah's care and Allah's protection. I want to be under Allah Taala's observation. وَلَا أُرِيدُ أَنَا اسْتَجِيرَ بِغَيْرِهِ And I do not want to ask anybody else for care other than Allah Taala. فَقَالَ الْوَلِيدُ لَهُ الْوَلِيدُ said to him انطلق إلى المسجد go to the masjid. فَرْدُدْ عَلَيَّ جَوَارِي عَلَانِيَةً كَمَا أَجَزْتُكَ عَلَانِيَةً Go to the masjid. Say it out in the open. That I am no longer being, I'm no longer under the supervision and the care of and what he did Why? Because if it's just between me and you and it's a whisper and then you go and something happens to you, people are going to sing, you are under my care. They won't believe me if I say, no, he wasn't under my care. So there's an official way to show them that you are no longer under my supervision. Go into the masjid, say it out in the open that the same way that I openly took you in. I told everybody, anyone who touches Uthman ibn Badrud, they've touched me. Go and do the same in public. They came to the masjid. He said, هذا عثمان بن مضعون قد جاء يرد علي جواري فقال عثمان صدق وقد وجدت وفيا كريم الجوار ولكني قد أحببت أن لا أستجير بغير الله So Uthman bin Mabarun said yes So Walid ibn al-Mughira said Everybody know that this minute onwards Uthman ibn Mabarun has what? He's left Me And Uthman ibn Mughira said, yes, correct. But while I was with, with, while I was with Al-Walid ibn Mughira, he took very good care of me. And then he said, everyone know that I am free from him. Then Uthman left. And this is where Labid ibn Rabi'ah read a line of poetry for them. This is before he took his salam. And he said, "Ala kullu shayin ma khala Allah, ma khala Allah baatil wa kullu naim illa mahala tazailu." Everything Allah Tabarak wa Taala, other than Him, is what? "Ala kullu shayin ma khala Allah baatil." Everything other than Allah Tabarak wa Taala is falsehood. Labid ibn Rabi'ah, this line of his is the last the quote in Qala bi Hashaa. The Prophet said. The Prophet said that. The most honest and truthful statement a poet ever said is the statement of who? Labid ibn al-Rabi'at ibn al-Amiri. ولذلك Rabi'at, Labid ibn al-Rabi'at, he was a poet before Islam. When they asked him, when he became a Muslim, they said he never, um, he never ever read poetry, he abandoned poetry, he left it. Are we all together? And some of the scholars, they said this story is not him. <clears throat> this story is to um, Zuhair ibn Ka'bin. There's a difference of opinion. But they said to him, why have you abandoned poetry? And then he said, Allah exchanged it for me, Surah Al-Baqarah. Oh, I don't need poetry, I have Surah Al-Baqarah. Yeah. Abu Salama ibn Abdul Asad. These are the people who returned back from uh, Abyssinia. From them was Abu Salama ibn Abdul Asad. He entered Mecca 
and he entered upon his uh, maternal uncle. Who is that? Who is his maternal uncle that he entered onto when he came back? Who is the Khal of Abu Salamat ibn Abd al-Asad? Yeah? Abu Lab would be correct, but the person he came to specifically is not Abu Lab. Abu Lab would give him up easily. So it's Abu Talib. He entered onto Abu Talib and he asked him for help. A man from the people of Bani Makhzub came rushing towards Abu Salaba. فَقَالُوا لَهُ They said to him, يَا أَبَا طَالِبْ لَقَدْ مَنَعْتَ بْنَ أَخِيكَ مُحَمَّدًا فَمَا لَكَ وَلِصَاحِبِنَا تَمْنَعْمُ مِنَّا They said to him, Nabi Lai Muhammad, you prevented us from him. All this time, he, you're the one who's taking care of him. But why are you stopping us from Abu Salama? Leave us from him. Everyone you want to give care and shelter to, leave Abu Salama for us. And then he said to them, Innahu stajara bi. He asked for my help and protection. Wa huwa bin ufti. He's a son of my sister. Wa in ana lab amna ibn ukhti lab amna ibn akhi. If I can't protect my sister's uh, son, then I can't protect my brother's son. Abdullah is his brother, right? فَقَامَ أَبُوْ لَعْبٍ غَاضِبًا أَبُوْ لَعْبٍ stood up angry. And he said, وَيَا مَعْشَرَ قُرَيْشٍ O Quraysh, وَاللَّهِ لَقَدْ أَكْثَرْتُهُمْ أَكْثَرْتُهُمْ عَلَى الشَّيْخِ مَا تَزَالُونَ تَتَتَأَبُونَ عَلَيْهِ فِي جَوَارِهِ مِنْ بَيْنِ قَوْمِهِ وَاللَّهِ لَتَنْتَهُنَّ عَنْهَا أَوْ لَنَقُومَنَّ بَعْهُ فِي كُلِّ مَا قَامَ فِيهِ حَتَّى يَبْلُغَ مَا أَرَادَ Abu Lahab stood up and he said Ya Ba'ashara Quraysh You guys have increased when it comes to the Shaykh and Abu Talib and every one of you guys are coming excessively to him from the people that he gives protection to. You guys going to leave this or we're going to stand up for whatever he stands up for. So this was something of tribe. They used to look at anybody who's protected by somebody. They looked at it as what? That's what they saw. Ibn Sa'd mentions in his babaqat that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud didn't return to Abyssinia. Is that correct? Did Abdullah ibn Mas'ud return back to Abyssinia? It's only, uh, did he return back to Abyssinia? And when he came to Medina, uh, sorry, Mecca, and he heard, did he go back to Abyssinia or did he stay here in Mecca? Yeah. That which is correct is that he stayed. Like in Musa'ad, he said what? He mentioned Abdullah ibn Sarud returned back to, to Abyssinia. That is incorrect. And he said, this is what Ibn Sa'd said in his tabaqat, Anna Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in lam yadkhul Mecca. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud did not enter Mecca. Wa anna raja'a ila al-habashi hatta qadima fi al-marati thaniyati ila al-madinati ba'a man qadima. That's a mistake. Ibn Qayyim corrected him here. And he said, Wa rudda hadha bi anna ibn Mas'ud in shahida badarak. This statement is incorrect. Because Abdullah ibn Mas'ud participated in what? The battle of Badr. So if he went back to Abyssinia, the people who returned to Abyssinia, they did not return until which battle? The battle of Muqtab. 
with who? Ja'far? The Prophet said about the day of Khaybar, what did he say? Yeah? He said, I don't know anything I should be more happy about that. I don't know which one to be happy more about. Khaybar or the victory of Khaybar or the return of Ja'far. So Ja'far did not participate in all of that battles. The first battle that Ja'far actually caught up with and he participated was which battle? The battle of Mu'ta, where he got killed. I will tell you that. So Abdullah bin Sulaiman, no, he participated in the battle of Badr. So he was there from the first battle that took place in Islam. وَأَجْهَزَ عَلَىٰ أَبِي جَعْلٍ وَأَصْحَابُ هَذِهِ الْهِجَرَةِ إِلَّا مَا قَدِمُ الْبَدِيلَ مَعَ جَعْفَرِ بْنَ أَبِي طَالِبٍ وَأَصْحَابِ بَعْدَ بَدْرٍ بِأَرْبَعَ سِنِينَ أَوْ خَمْسٍ Four or five years later, after the Battle of Badr, did the uh, Abu Ja'far and all of them come, they say. Quraysh came, and they argued with the Prophet ﷺ regarding the affairs of the Prophet ﷺ. Kufaru Quraysh, they realized their harm towards the Muslims. They realized now that the persecution and the hitting and the lashing and the beating that they were doing was not turning any, anyone away from the message of Islam. Rather, the people were, were running towards Islam. And their mockery and all of that was not working. So they thought to themselves, there is no way we can stop this. How about if we just stop it where it's coming from? Who is it that's mentioned in all of this? Who is it coming from, Nabi Muhammad? Let's get to him. So they came to Abu Talib to have an agreement with him, Mufawada, and discussion, something, some contract. They went to him this time. They said, Ya Abu Talib, Innaka laka sinnan wa sharafan. You are a very respected man. You have age. You're an old man. Amongst us, we look up to you, Abu Talib. We have nothing but respect for you. Your nephew, he is harming us. He harms us in our gatherings, in our circles, and everywhere. We have asked you to stop him. We requested from you to bring an end to this. You refuse to do that for us. They said, We by Allah, we can't be patient. We cannot sit around and watch our forefathers being insulted. We cannot sit around and watch someone be to our logic and the way that we think. He's saying about us that we're worshipping rocks and stones and he's saying their intellect is not making sense. He's belittling us. He's putting down our aql. And he's also He's insulting our idols. By the way, the Prophet didn't do neither all of that. We're all together, brothers. Insult was not the Prophet. The Prophet was not one who insulted. Are we all together, brothers? Brothers. It's sad to see today some people who want to preach Islam, call the people to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And their method is what? Yeah? Their method is insult, name calling. Kaif. Yeah? How can you say, I'm calling the people to the truth, I'm calling them to the deed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you're insulting them? It does not matter who that person is. 
to go to a level of insult and name calling. Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah said something very powerful. He said, Ashatmu, Walla'amu, name calling, cursing, vulgar speech. He said it's something everyone could do. It's not a profession. You make insults, the other person can do insults. So it's not like other people can't do that. But it's just a level you just don't go to. Are we all together, brothers? Allah told us in the Quran, وَلَا تَصُبُّ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَصُبُّ اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرًا Do not insult the non-Muslims. Because that would then lead them to do what? To insult Allah's religion. Do you know sometimes people won't listen to your message? But they're going to look at the message you're saying. I'm sorry, they're going to look at the way, that you, the way that you're carrying yourself. They're not going to listen to the message. They're not going to listen to what you have to say. But they're going to look at the way that you're speaking and the way that you're carrying yourself. Well, in everybody who is trying to teach the people the deed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, know that the seat, the chair that you're sitting on, to the Amma to Nas is the Prophet's seat, alayhi salatu wasalam. Some people look at you who's practicing and they think whatever you do is what the Prophet would have done. We're all together, brothers. So if you're preaching and people are referring to you to insult, the Prophet was told والسلام, to turn away from all of that. Are we all together? But they considered insult when the Prophet would say, for example, or the Quran would say, do not worship these idols, they do not benefit you or harm you. There is no good in worshipping these idols, that was an insult to them. So, like some people, if you say to them, <clears throat> do not call on to the awliya of Allah. What will they say to you? You are insulting the awliya. Are you insulting the awliya? No, no, you're not insulting the awliya. You're putting them where they what? Where Allah put them, subhanahu wa ta'ala. You get close. If they're from the awliya of Allah, what do you do? You get closer to Allah by loving them, sah? The issue is not love or insult. The issue is not giving them more than their rights. So there are some people who think that there is insult in what you're saying, but vulgar speech is cons consensus. Everyone agrees that it's insult, sah? Using the F word, B word, C word, T word, L word, M word, C word. There are those words. Whilst you speak, it's not good for this However much you get angry in your life Insult is not a good thing Teaching yourself vulgar speech Some people when they get angry with their family and their children What are the things that they say? Vulgar speech Remember those words that you say, you will be held accountable to Yom al Qiyamah, the people you insulted and the names that you gave them. This is Hasanat. It's what? Hasanat Yom al Qiyamah. It's not Dinam and Dirham. It's going to be what? Good deeds are going to be taken from people. The poet said, he said, protect your tongue. Do not let it bite you. Your tongue is a, it's a snake. Don't let it bite you. How many people ended up in their graves because of words that they said? So your tongue is a very powerful organ that can work for you uh, and it can also work against you. So the, the Prophet didn't insult any idols of theirs and he did not belittle uh, the, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but what the Prophet spoke was the, the reality. 
that worshiping idols is wrong. Alayhi salatu wasalam. He stuck to the principles and the concepts. He did not make it about the person of putting the person down and all of that. Alayhi, alayhi salatu wasalam. So, وَإِنَّا وَاللَّهِ لَا نَصْبِرُ عَلَىٰ هَذَا مِنْ شَتْبِ آبَائِنَا وَتَسْفِيهِ أَحْلَىٰ بِنَا وَعَيْبِ آلِهَتِنَا حَتَّى تَكُفَّهُ عَنَّا Abu Talib, this is what we want from you. Stop him from us. أَوْ نُنَازِلَهُ وَإِيَّاكَ فِي ذَلِكَ حَتَّى يَهْلِكَ أَحَدُ الْفَرِيقَيْنِ Or, we're going to be forced to all put you in the same camp. And we're going to leave you. We're going to see you now part of him. And this is one of the hikmah that the scholars mentioned why Abu Talib then did not embrace Islam. One of the benefits of why he did not embrace Islam is because this is what they would have done from the beginning. If he took Islam, they would have put him in the same. But they believe he's one of them. So he was able to stop. He could say to them, I believe what you guys believe. I have not, not with his religion. So they gave them that feeling, okay, Abu Talib is with us. But he was also defending the Prophet So this issue became big in the eyes of Abu Talib. Brothers, the reason is because Quraysh, I mentioned this to you at the beginning of the Siyan. Quraysh was a tribe that every single person in the Arabian Peninsula respected. If an internal war started between them, it makes everybody else say, okay, I want to get involved as well. Does that make sense? The minute Quraysh has these issues going on, what's going to happen? All the other tribes that had that respect for Quraysh. Yani after Alam, Alam Tarakif, Ma'ala Rabbuka bi Ashabin Feen. When he came down, Quraysh had this status now from that day onwards. Are we all together? Abdul Muttalib's personality and his character gave Quraysh that. So now, Abu Lahab, Quraysh, Abu Talib on one side, this, this unity and this raid, they didn't like that. They knew this was cause a big problem for them. They tried to hush hush. Please, end this Abu Talib, please, between us, finish this. But also Abu Talib, he has that tradition where he still wants the unity of Quraysh. So the leadership can carry on. So for him, this is, He's being pulled from one side to another side. He loves Nabi Lai Muhammad. He sees the noble character that he has. He sees him. And what he's saying is true. Are we all together? He believes it. Abu Talib believes what Nabi Lai Muhammad is calling to. He just doesn't proclaim it. Are we all together? Is it enough to be a Muslim just to believe something? Yeah? It's not enough to just believe it. You have to proclaim it. You have to say it. He didn't want to say that. In his famous Lamiya, in his famous line of poetry, he says there, he mentions. Does anyone know it? What he said in his Lamiya, Abu Talib. Anyone? No one knows? Okay, this is your homework. To find what Abu Talib said about the Prophet والسلام, and how he mentioned that he, the Prophet وسلم, is upon the truth. And the reason why I can't take his religion is because I'm going to have to then disagree with all my forefathers. I can't do that. So this is why he went. Anyways, Abu Talib, this whole issue caused him pain in his heart. He didn't want this disunity. And he didn't also want to embrace Islam. He also did not want to deceive the Prophet. So he thought, 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 what can he possibly do? Quraysh is now at that T junction. You see, they, they can't move forward. There's a problem now. Abu Talib has to open the, the, the move that road from uh, that rock so they can go forward. But he, he doesn't want to deceive Nabi Lai Muhammad. He doesn't want to also embrace his, his religion. So he sends Aqil. Aqil is the son of who? 
Aqil is Abu Talib's son. What did we mention about Aqil last time? Okay. Ah. Ah. Hayef. Uh, what did he say? He uh, was left with the botanic uh, quality came. He talked to the son, so I the botanic said. Okay, but what else did we mention about Akin? Huh? That's what point we mentioned, eh? It's a chap. But how is his relationship with Akin and uh, Abu Talib? Huh? The most, he was the most beloved to him. So Aqeel Abi Talib, he's a prophet's cousin. And Aqeel, did he take his lap? Yeah? Yeah? What about the Battle of Badr? Was he a Muslim? Yeah? Huh? Put your hand up if you believe Aqil took Islam. Ayyah. Who believes he was not Muslim? He never became Islam. Aqil was a non Muslim. Oh, he. Aqil embraced Islam قبل الحديبية, just before Hudaybiyah embraced Islam. Like in the Battle of Badr, he came with the non-Muslims. He wasn't a Muslim in the Battle of Badr. Why did he come? Yeah? He came because he was muqrah, he was forced. Quraysh forced him to become what? Uh, but he never embraced Islam until the end, just before Hudaybiyah. He migrated to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then he participated also in the battle of Ghazwat Mu'ta with Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. Uh, but after Mu'ta, there was no other battles that he was mentioned to participate in. Scholars have mentioned, like Ibn Hajar in his Kitab al Isaba fi Tamizi Sahaba, that maybe he was wounded or something happened to him or he was sick. Yani, the battles of Hunayn and all of that which happened after Mu'ta, there's no mention of him. Um, participating uh, in it, even the conquest of Mecca, there's no mention of him. So the Prophet ﷺ, he sent Aqil, so Abu Talib, sorry, sent Aqil to the Prophet. When the Prophet came, he said to him, He said to him, So the Prophet came, Aqil brought the prophets to Abu Talib. Abu Talib now wants to talk to Aqi, uh, sorry, uh, Abu Namila uh, Muhammad. He says to him, Inna qawmaka, your people, qad ja'uni, they came to me. Faza'amu annaka tu'dihim fi nadihim. And they say that you harm them in their assemblies and their gatherings. We fit the fi majlisihim. And in their gatherings. Leave this, don't do this to them. وَبْقِعْ عَلَيَّا وَعَلَى نَفْسِكَ وَلَا تُحَمِّلْنِي مِنَ الْأَمْنِ مَا لَا أُوْتِقْ He said, please, don't do this. And don't enforce me to be, reach a point where I do what I don't want to do. Then what happened was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he raised his eyes to the Saba and he said Atarawna hadihi shams do you, do you see this uh, sun? The Prophet said this Alayhi Salatu Wasallam So he said yes The Prophet then said Ma ana biaqadar ala an ad'a thalika minkum I can't leave this the message I have to give, that which I have to call to, I cannot leave it. And I will stay my course. 
I will call to that which I believe with conviction. You see, people look at your conviction sometimes and it gives them the conviction, con, con, the con, what did I say? Conviction. The conviction that you come with gives conviction to those people who are around you. And so, Abu Talib, Abu Lahab, sorry, Abu Talib saw this and as soon as he realized how strong-minded the Prophet is and he's not going to let go of this, he said, Wallahi, ما كذب ابن أخي قط والله my nephew has never ever lied so he's not going to lie now he's not going to leave this message so فرجعوا لي go back so this is uh, what happened as for the narration that says يا ابن عمي ما أنقل والله لو وضع الشمس في يميني if they were to place the sun in my right والقمر في يساري and they placed the moon in my left على أن أترك هذا الأمر so that I leave this affairs حتى يظهره الله أو أهلك فيه ما تركته I will never leave it this narration is what it's not authentic it's very weak So then what did Quraysh now do? Abu Talib said, I can't do anything for you guys. Do what you want. So what did they do? Quraysh then saw that the Prophet ﷺ is consistent upon his da'wah. And that Abu Talib has let, is not gonna let, he's not going to give up Nabi Allah Muhammad. And he's not going to surrender it. They came to the Prophet directly himself. I'll mention this story, inshallah, as long. I'm going to mention the next lesson, inshallah, in ta'ala. Uh, I'll take questions if anyone has any questions. From that. The Firaud disciple is like. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Today, he read, In the Ladina Jao bil ifki rusba to mean from la tahsibu, shabra lakum sah. Uh, so I, uh, my belief is he read Warsh and Nafa. Does anyone disagree? Huh? Yeah, that's what it looked like he read. Huh? 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 The Lamia. Google. Does write Lamia to Abu Talib? It'll come out. His whole Qasid will come out. Ah, uh, yeah. Any questions? Ah, uh, yeah. What did Sheikh Al Islam and Taymiyyah say about this? The prostrating of the non Muslims. What was the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah? I read it a long time ago, I can't remember now. I can't precisely remember what he said, Sheikh Al-Islam. But it's easy to find, I'll find it. Okay. Any other questions? Hey, barakallahu feekum, subhanakallahu wa bihamdihi, ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayhi.